A tragic accident took their daughter away. Time just stops in that moment. But gave these people the biggest gift they could ever hope for. It would have been something she wanted. Now they're coming together in an emotional reunion to celebrate the life they've been given. Do you feel different? Of course, it's the heart. <laughs> and the daughter that made it all possible. We'll never have peace with losing Taylor, but when I looked at Patricia, it gave us so much strength. All right, a little about me. I'm recently married. Ah. I work with my wife on this show, and I'm learning how to be a dad to two amazing kids in a blended family. <laughs> I'm hosting a talk show because there's a lot to talk about. This is the adventure. It's Welcome to the show. Thank you. Have a seat. Big show today. Uh, one of the most touching stories I've ever heard, and I'm so grateful they chose our show to come on and share it. Grieving parents who made a selfless yet heartbreaking decision to donate their teenage daughter's organs after a horrific accident. We have the mother of two who received the 13-year-old's heart, and we have the man who biked 500 miles across the state of Iowa after receiving their daughter's kidney. An amazing story, and the organ recipients will meet for the first time today. I think you're gonna be really moved and hug your kids a little tighter after the show's over. First, Yvette, Nicole Brown is here. Hey, Jeff. How are you? Good, I'm good. You know, I was, I was, tell me what you think. When I, when we have a show like this and mm. we met the family backstage and, you know, it's a, it's a dramatic story. Yeah. It's heart wrenching. Mm -hmm. And so then you think, well, should you come out and start this show somber? Hmm. And then I thought, no, the whole point of donating organs is to affirming continue. Affirming life. Yes. Yeah, is to, life. So we do the same show we always right. do, even though the subject matter is not as silly mm -hmm. as the stuff we will talk right. about here. But we'll get there. We'll get to the heavy. We can start with the fun yeah. and get to the heavy. I brought this up the other day to mm -hmm. you, and I thought this might be good to talk about. Okay. This is what's on my mind. <laughs> How do you leave a relationship, not a girlfriend, a relationship a like friendship. with a friend or a relationship with a habit or whatever it is that you happen to have. <laughs> and I was thinking about it because my buddy called me the other day and he said, he, go, he goes, you know, I ended a relationship the other day with, and he told me this his friend's name. And I said, how'd you do it? And he said, I just stopped writing back. I said, God, that's kind of. the coward's way. Yeah, I, kind, I said that, I go, that's mm -hmm. kind of just, you might've hurt his feelings. And he said, well, he never wrote me back. I said, well, yeah, because you stopped writing him. And then we started talking about that. You know, there's a couple of schools of thought. Like the first, first, wow, you see that? Sorry, everybody. Did you just spit? A little bit of spit just went right out. There, you just got it? Brown That's the spittle. love. That's the love. Sell it on eBay. Okay. Um, there's two schools of thought about it. The one side of it is, you know, sometimes you lose friendships because you do, your life changes. And it's not that you decide I'm never going to call them again. You just look up and it's like, oh, my God, I haven't talked to Sally in five years or three months or whatever. So that, I think, is just the natural ebb and flow of any type of relationship because Sally didn't call you, you didn't call Sally, and you're in different places. But I think that if it's someone that means a lot to you and it hasn't been a blow-up, but you just feel like this person's no longer good for you, then I think that's when you need to have the conversation. What if it's neither? What, what if mean? it's just, well, like, I'll tell you, on this, with Survivor, people didn't necessarily know how to get a hold of me. But... But with the talk show, it's pretty easy to track me down. Right. And I've had a lot of you know, old friends. Older friends. Yeah. Yes. Send an email and, and it gets forward on. And then I feel the obligation. Well, what, they know what, I got it. What so. kind, well, they don't know. They know now. <laughs> uh, what kind of older friend? It, it what might what be, quality of it? It might be like, you know, 20 years ago, we knew each other a little bit, but they're really friendly. They're like, Probes, what's up? Let's grab a drink. And they go, well, here's what I'm thinking. Okay, tell me if you're with me, because with Facebook and everything, we all have a gazillion friends, mm -hmm. but we don't have a gazillion hours. Right. We only have a little bit of time to have right. a drink, and I want to have it with somebody I really want to have the drink with. And the thing, right. <laughs> the thing you also have to think about is, why does he want to have a drink with you now? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, my thing is, if it's been 20 years... It'd be different if you were best friends and you moved away and they couldn't find you. And, oh, my God, I found Jeff Probst. He was my best friend. When, you get, when they send that email and when you get that email, there will be that, that mutual, oh, my God, it's Johnny. Right? right? So my that's thought so is... That's so weird. That's his name. That's his name. Now, if you don't... 
if you get the email and you don't feel that flash or that rush of, oh my God, it's whoever, then nine times out of 10, the friendship ended 20 years ago for a purpose. And they're now reaching out to you for a purpose. And you have to decide, do you want to let this person that's so reaching out for a say, purpose? How do you, how do you, somebody's been in your life mm -hmm. and it's been great. Yes. But you weren't really close friends. You would just hang out. But that was at a time in your life when maybe you weren't as busy. Right. And now your life's a little, or you've got your circle of friends, or you, now you're a parent, or now you're in a, a, a romantic mm -hmm. relationship. I always feel like I would like to say, here's, the, here's my truth. I loved when we hung out. I mean, there was five years where you and I were inseparable. We were tight. Yeah. than thieves. And God, we yes. did some great funny yes, things. Yes, we did. And I remember some of them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> However... But the truth is... Here's the, here's the timeline. I'm only going to live somewhere, you know, somewhere in this area, I'm going to die. And when I honestly think about it, I feel like our friendship was great then. Right now I'm hanging out with a different group of friends. Look, it's not like I'm not doing stuff on Friday. I am, and I just, and then now I'm in the hole. I can't do it. You can't do it. So can't then you it. just stop writing. No, you just say, look, Johnny, it's great to, great to you know, reintroduce myself to you and glad to hear about your kids and me and Lisa and the kids are doing great. You know, I, as you know, I do two shows and I'm a little busy, so it's not that I don't want to have a drink with you, but I'm about to get on a plane and go to Bangladesh for the 57th <laughs> edition of Survivor. And this is the thing, if Johnny is really your friend, he's aware how busy you are. Okay. And he also knows it's been 20 years, so when he reaches out, he knows that really all, if he's doing it for the right reason, he really just wants to reconnect, get a hello, and then he's gonna be like, if it continues, it so continues. you don't think, you don't think, because the thing that drives me nuts when I meet people and I say, man, what's going on? When people say, I, when people say really busy, I want to say, that's redundant. Anymore, everyone's really busy. We're all really busy. You just, are you busier than me? Is this going to be the competition? Because everyone's busy. I don't care what you do. Even if you're just like I was in the Pandera, Pan... Panera Bread. Panera Bread the other Very day. Very tasty. And a guy sat there, he was having a sandwich, and all he did on his iPad with his little fold-up thing so it's set up high is he just hit refresh on Facebook. About, like, almost like he had a, you know... A, Maybe he was busy doing that. My point. That's right. So when I hear somebody say they're too busy, I don't want to give that... I'm, the truth is I am too busy for this friendship. I am. I've made other choices. That's the truth. What you're really saying is, I'm not too busy for the friendship. I'm just too busy right now. Okay, then when you're back from Survivor, how about then? No, then I have uh, school projects with well, the kids. Well, you know what, look, if your truth is that you really don't want to be friends with Johnny, you can always say, you know what, Johnny, it was, it was really great to hear from you. Will you tell him? How <laughs> Let's call Johnny. I'll talk to Johnny. What would you say? So I was, I, if, if I was talking for you, yeah. like to help you, uh, hello, you be Johnny. Okay. Hello, Johnny. Hi. <laughs> Hi, who's this? Hi, it's Yvette Nicole Brown. I'm, I'm, your, I'm a friend of your friend, Jeff Probst. You ever watch oh, the Jeff Probst I, show? I, I, hello, I've known haired, Probst for 20 years. Fluffy haired girl. Okay, look, uh, Johnny. Oh, you're really funny. Oh, thank you, Johnny. Yeah. Johnny, I want to tell you something. Jeff could not call you because he's in, in Kuala Lumpur for the 57th edition of, of Survivor. That's where we shot the very first well, season. I, I know this show. So he's back returning, and he wanted me to tell you that he really, really loves your friendship. Are you his assistant, huh? too? I, I do anything Jeff Probst needs me to do. I fulfill needs. Okay, anyway, Jeff Probst <laughs> wanted me to tell you that he's unavailable right now to, to continue the friendship. However, Whoa. however, jo Johnny, don't get like that, Johnny, because you know, Johnny, you know you only called him because you saw him on Survivor, so let's be real about this, Johnny. You weren't thinking about him for 20 years. I never said and that. Johnny, you did. I, I know, Johnny, if you had not seen him on Survivor, you wouldn't have thought about Jeff Probst. Now, we know what this is, Johnny. Now, I'm telling you now <laughs> that he's too busy to play these little reindeer games. So what he's going to do is he's going to send you an email and tell you he's doing great, and he's going to listen to you tell him about your family, and then we're going to move on, Johnny. Wow. We're going to move on. Wow. We're You're gonna move awesome. On. There's a whole business here. We know what this is, Johnny. We know what this is. Oh, my God, Yvette, you can do anything. You're like a superhero. Just saying. You're, you're... It's all just in humor and just making sure you, you, uh, you appreciate their feelings and you understand their feelings, but you have to tell the truth about the situation. And Johnny knows what he's doing when he calls you. Don't tell me about Don't my emotions. Don't tell me about my emotions. All right, we're going to play a lying game. We'll take a break. Who's right is next. I have the truth on all three answers. What did he just say to you? He said he's telling the truth. You guys, I've been trying to tell you, the game began already. He's not your friend in this. Know that. <laughs> hold on, hold on, hold on. What? She threw it on the gauntlet. Wait, this is awesome. This would be a first, Netta.
Time for Who's Right? The Lion Game. Lisa Russell is the announcer, my wife. Hello! Yvette, who's playing? Today we have Netta, who loves cooking, and she's from a Purdue graduate. Hi, Netta. Hi. Welcome. <laughs> And we have Debbie, who's a huge fan of the show. She's traveled to 59 countries all seven, wow. in all seven continents. Yep. Wow. Very impressive. Man. Very impressive. All right, uh, you guys rock, paper, scissors. Who won? I did. All right, Netta, are you going to answer or force Debbie to answer? Um, I'll answer. All right, Debbie, okay. have a seat here. <laughs> Netta, you have to get two out of three right. Otherwise, Debbie wins. OK. Here we go, Lisa. <laughs> OK. I'm ready. Nuts are popular snack food. This is true. The question you have to answer is, why are cashews almost never sold in the shell? I'll tell you why. Because cashews are in the same family as poison ivy, and they cause the same reaction. So if you were to eat raw cashews, your skin would start to itch. That's why they're roasted, typically, to get all the irritants out. Truth? False. <laughs> what? Hold on, hold on, hold on. What? The Wait, this is awesome. <laughs> this would be a first, Netta. You could opt to not even hear her answer. Oh, I have to. <laughs> Just if if you want. Okay, no, 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 no. Okay. I'll, I'll listen okay, to you her answer. <laughs> Thanks, Netta. Thank you. Um, <laughs> cashews are almost never sold in the shell because they're too hard to open. The shell is literally as hard as a rock and requires a lot of work to pry it open. So that's why it's, the cashews are already out and free. Free. Ooh. <laughs> So is it the toxic shell <laughs> or um, the hard shell? It's the hard shell. The hard shell. Netta knows. She pointed. She's from Purdue. It's the hard shell. Who's telling the <laughs> truth? Very confident. And you're wrong. Oh, man. I told Netta. you I do things I'm not proud of, people. Okay, I just so lied to Netta. One, that's All right, so you're, you're one in the hole. Whoa. Good news for Debbie. <laughs> there it is. It looks like a pepper. So you have to get this one right, Netta. Otherwise, Debbie wins. OK. All right, hit it, Lisa. I'm ready. African elephants are the largest land mammal on the planet. This is true. The question you have to answer is, what else is also true about elephants? Mm. Right, okay. This one breaks my heart. They grieve, and they can die of a broken heart, especially, I know, especially a baby elephant when their mother dies and they're left orphaned. They can die of a broken heart. <laughs> or... It's not true at all. In fact, the whole idea that an elephant never forgets is funny because the truth is an elephant has a terrible memory. They don't remember trainers. They don't remember where they've been. They don't remember anything. They certainly wouldn't be connected, as loving as it sounds, to their baby and, and die of a broken heart. They can't you remember anything. You ever seen Dumbo? <laughs> <laughs> it's a they fairy can tale. Grieve. They can grieve, girl. They grieve. Jeez, OK. Um, I'm going to have to go with Jeff. Okay, you're gonna go with me. You think I'm telling the truth? Oh, oh man. Lisa, yeah. is it too nah, nah. late to change it? Yeah, it's too late. <laughs> it's too late now, Nana. <laughs> Tell the truth, Lisa. Who's telling the truth? Sorry, you're wrong. Oh man, Debbie wins. Nana, have a seat. <laughs> Debbie, by doing nothing other than sitting in a chair, you have defeated Nana at the game Who's Right? And I love it when somebody loses. I don't know what it is. Ah, Netta, you seem evil. delightful. It's evil is what that it is. Easy. Debbie, you have won a $125 gift card to Dairy Queen. Oh, okay. <laughs> Netta, I got to ask, what was the rationale? Humans can die of a broken heart. So I thought, like, maybe, I don't know. It's, Dumbo is all you need to know. I all right, know. so I, I thought about Debbie is one. Hand, Debbie, 125 gift card to Dairy Queen. Oh, my God, Dairy Queen. A lot of blizzards, oh, come baby. On. You could take all of us right now. A lot of blizzards. We get the one that has the peanuts in it. <laughs> what's, oh, or oh, oh, you trade for what's in the box. I gotta go for the box. Okay, you've given up DQ. Yeah. I would so love DQ right now. <laughs> sometimes these are great, and okay. sometimes they are thrift okay. store items from North Hollywood okay. that I put in my car and drove over here. <laughs> Skin Transformer, hey! skin care and beauty products created by beauty expert Sarah McNamara. She came up with this product that hydrates, primes, enhances, and protects the skin all in one easy, time-saving hey. application. You. you just put it on and feel all good. You can watch Beth Nicole Brown Community Thursday nights up next.
How a family turned what is truly a nightmare into a life-saving mission. It's an awesome story. Be right back. I mean, when we made that decision, I remember looking at Todd saying, I need to hear her heartbeat. Beating, beating at someone else. Closed captioning for the Jeff Probst Show provided by... In 2010, Todd, Tara, and their three children embarked on their first family ski trip, but their dream vacation did not go as planned. Roll it. We were all excited about going on this spring break trip and had planned out this big car ride, and you know, I could still hear all the laughter in the car. It was such a fun trip. At the end of the day, Peyton and I were really tired, so we decided to hang back and get some hot chocolate, and they wanted to go on one more run. They were like, let's go on a family run, come on, and like, we're gonna hold back, but y'all have fun, and we'll see you down in an hour. And so the three of us went up for one more run. Ryan goes, which was typical. Taylor went, and then I went. She slipped a little bit and kind of went backwards, and she was out of control, but still going down, and she went into the trees. When I got to her, she was unconscious, and. And so I'm just going into, you know, teetering on panic mode, but trying to figure out logistics of what's about to happen. Peyton and I were waiting for them. Time started to go really long, and I, they were running late. And we come out, and I see Todd coming down the escalator with Ryan behind him. And he said, there's been an accident. She's unconscious. And, um, but it's going to be okay. I remember you saying, it's. It's, but it's going to be okay. Todd and Tara are with us. Thanks for being here. Obviously, you, ha you have to start by acknowledging your daughter, Taylor, and mm -hmm. saying how sorry we are, we are for your loss. And, and, you know, I said to you just before we walked on, I just recently became a dad. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I can't, you can't imagine it. You just, your brain does not allow you to imagine this. Right. Mm -hmm. So take us in there. What, when did you d discover how serious the injuries were? In, when, we got to the, when we got to the hospital and we realized when they told us that her injuries um, were too tough to handle there, they had to care fly her. That was kind of obviously a, a red flag. But when we got to the hospital and we heard from the orthopedic surgeon and he started rattling off the things that were wrong. What her, did he say? You know, her legs broken, her jaws broken, there's some issues with, you know, uh, ribs and just a whole laundry list of things. Lungs and C7. And well, Taylor's a big volleyball player. So my mind went to protection mode of, okay, when is she going to get to play volleyball again? You know, she's got a big tournament. She's so active. It's her love. It's her life. And he looked at us and said, you know, the injuries I've described are really the least of your issues. There's a head injury, wow. and mm -hmm. that's where you need to focus your efforts. And I looked at him and, you know, and said, are you telling me that we're dealing with a life or de death situation? And he looked at us and said, we, I need you to prepare for that and talk to uh, the neurosurgeon about it. And what, so what happens in that moment for a parent? Are you in shock or are you able to think clearly? Mm -hmm. It's very numbing and you never want to cross that line of they can fix it to no, they can't. And you always want to have that hope that everything's going to be okay. So when you get word from a neurosurgeon that um, we need to prepare ourselves, you quickly cross that line and you feel hopeless and out of control. Mm. And, um, it's just a very, it's a very difficult feeling to describe. It's a piercing feeling. So how do you, what happens to, that gives you that strength? Where does it come from? Because you could crumble. <sighs> yes, and you do. Um, you do crumble. Grief journey is, a, is tough and it's different. But what brings you that strength, at least for us? I mean, because everybody's journey is different. Mm -hmm. For us, 
it's our relationship, it's our faith, it's our other two children, mm -hmm. me, Ryan and Peyton. Mm -hmm. um, we were talking about it. My grandfather's words just rang true in my head almost from the beginning, which is, you know, Todd, it's not what happens to you that matters, it's how you react to it that does. Mm. Um, but you're grasping for any signs of hope. You really are. It's dark. Mm -hmm. And at what point do you decide we're going to, we're going to make sure that Taylor lives on? Well, we had um, someone come in the room with us um, when we knew what we were facing and say, she is a beautiful candidate for organ donation. Would you consider it? And we knew it was something she would have wanted. We never had the discussion in our family. Hmm. We never sat around the dinner table talking about organ donation or if this is what we, our wishes are. But we knew by the type of child Taylor was, such a hmm. giving, caring child, it would have been something she wanted. So we made that decision. <laughs> That moment, that moment was the easiest decision and the most horrible of time. And when we got asked that question, I looked at Tara, and I could see in her eyes, we'd been married almost 20 years, and we knew the answer was yes. And from that decision to say yes about organ donation, so many beautiful things mm. have come out of it. And it we're, was a privilege to be asked that was. question. This, you, you just turned the story because this is, as, as you said to me uh, right before we walked out here, both Todd and Tara said, remember, this isn't a sob sob story. This is a, actually a story of hope. Absolutely. Right. And you just turned the corner, which is how do you take a situation like this, their beautiful daughter gone, and they make the decision to find a selfless, beautiful way to let her live on and help others live. That story's next. Be right back. Isn't it amazing how fast all that silliness in your life just evaporates like cotton candy? It's just, it's crazy all the little stuff we worry about and then you go, oh yeah, my life's amazing. I think I've only cried on this show maybe one other time, but I can't, I just can't get this beautiful image of this, this girl. I didn't even finish what I was saying because I needed to stop. I remember us just um, kind of just piling on top of Taylor and just yelling at her to wake up, just to, you know, please wake up, please wake up, please wake up. We had someone come in and sit with us and say she's a beautiful candidate for organ donation. Would you consider it? I remember Todd was standing beside her and I was on the couch by her feet and out of the hardest decisions we were making, that was the easiest one because she was such a giving, caring child, we knew that it was something she would have wanted. We're back with Todd and Tara talking about their decision. Mm. I think I've only cried on this show maybe one other time, but I can't, I just can't get this beautiful image of this, this girl. I didn't even finish what I was saying because I needed to stop, is the decision you guys made to donate Taylor's organs and what really gets me is you didn't even have to know your daughter would want that. Right. Whatever connection you guys had as a family, it was mm -hmm. clearly strong enough to know, we know our kid, and this is what she wants. Right. I also know that you didn't want to go back into Taylor's bedroom. You haven't been back in her bedroom. You left it the same. I've had a very hard time. Mm -hmm. it's, it's like life interrupted in there right now. Mm -hmm. um, I ha don't have it in me to go in and change things. At the, and maybe I will get there. The door is open and sun comes through. Hmm. But it has um, been a very difficult part for me to cross that threshold because we had such beautiful memories in there. And people would think that that would be such a comforting place for me. Um, but I'm finding it in other ways where I know she's with me. I don't have to be in her room. And someday I probably will. And I love that you let Adrian, one of our producers, and Brett, the editor who's, who's putting all this together, go in there that you mm -hmm. trusted us enough to let it out because it's very powerful to see that. Mm -hmm. So yeah. now you have the the tangible thing. Now I have to decide what organs will we donate? Right. Right. How do you right. do that? Well, first of all, the, uh, the, the transplant coordinators, that this is their job, what beautiful people they are. I mean, mm -hmm. to deal with families in these situations. Um, we had a meeting and uh, it was you know, probably longer than we thought. I mean, time just stops in that moment. And we went through the questions of, and we chose the organs and I think we chose pretty much everything. There was one instance where they said eyes 
And I remember both Tara and I were like, no, because Taylor had those beautiful, striking blue eyes. And you were like, I can't do that. You know, I can't see that happening. But in that moment, she said to us, it's the cornea, just a clear layer, of, you know, just a clear layer. And thank goodness we were listening because she's given sight to another daughter. And so, um, yeah. Yeah. it's great. So that's, um, you know, that's a, that's a huge part with organ donation for people what to What are, just rattle off the things, because I'm not even sure if I know all of right. the parts we can donate. Pretty much everything. I mean, like, really? Yeah, pretty much really everything mean. from heart to liver to lungs to corneas skin, to tissue to kidney. kidneys, mm -hmm. pancreases, lungs. We weren't able to donate lungs because of our injury, but just about everything. Jeff. When was the first moment when you had an emotional realization that it was no longer disconnected, it's corneas, but as you said, it was sight? What was the first time? Oh, gosh. I mean, we started hearing, um, actually, it was in the hospital when we made the decision the transplant coordinator came to us and just, I remember I was sitting on the couch and she kneeled down right in front of me and she said, let me tell you what this decision is doing. And her heart is going to be going to a mom. Her kidney is going to be going to a grandfather. Her kid. So she told us, and then she told us, you know, your daughter is giving life. This person is going to be able to see. This mom is now going to be able to live. So it was that thread of hope we were hanging on. Mm. And from that very moment, I wanted to hear Taylor's heart. Right. I mean, when we made that decision, mm -hmm. I remember looking at Todd saying, I need to hear her heartbeat. Beating, beating I did. someone else. And, and I can't explain why. It was just that longing. And Taylor and I used to give each other these heart-to-heart -heart hugs, these real tight heart-to-heart -heart hugs. And we just snuggled together in bed. Now, and this I photo right here, I interrupted you, but yes. is that you listening to it? Yes. Yep. All right, we're, gonna, we're up next, the woman who has Taylor's heart. We'll be right back. When you wait for two years, you play this in your brain as far as what beautiful heart you're going to receive. Closed captioning for the Jeff Probst Show provided by... Thirteen years old, Taylor was 13. She was in a skiing accident and it left her with irreversible brain damage. Her parents made a beautiful decision to donate her organs. And after two years on a waiting list, imagine that, for a heart transplant, Patricia, a mother of two, received Taylor's heart. Welcome. <laughs> so even just this shot, the shot of the two moms, I mean, you, you don't even need to say anything. It's so powerful. What is it like to go through waiting and wondering if you're going to live to be a mom? That was probably the hardest part because you don't know. You, the unknown of if today is going to be the day that my heart is going to fail. Um, there's always a guessing game um, with hearts and other transplants. They always want you to be the sickest that you can be so you can get a heart or a kidney or whatever. So you're really on that fine line of mm. um, how sick are you and if you're too sick to actually get a Wow, or, so it's a delicate balance It is a delicate balance, exactly. So when you get the call, mm -hmm. is that what happens? You get a phone call? Yep. And what do they say? 12.30 at night. Hey, Patricia, this is Peggy. And of course, we have a relationship with these people. You've known them for a couple of years through the transplant um, uh, facility that I went to. And they just ask, how are you feeling? Do you have a cold or do you have a fever? And I knew what that meant. That meant, are you well enough to receive a heart tonight? Tonight. Mm -hmm. And then simultaneously, you know, as a compassionate human, this means a tragedy has happened. Of course. So yeah. you, you get the surgery, mm -hmm. and it works. It works. What does that feel like when you wake up in the morning? Mm -hmm. Can you, do you feel different? Of course. Um, my heart beats regularly. Um, when I woke up from surgery, it felt like I had been underwater for two years, even prior to that. And I felt like for the first time I, could, I was actually above water breathing and I had a regular heart rate and it just felt awesome. And is there an emotional, is it because you know I have 
someone else's heart, is there a, a different feeling as a, just as a human? Of course, it's the heart. <laughs> um, and you, you, when you wait for two years, you play this in your brain as far as who you think you're going to, what beautiful heart you're going to receive mm. and, and what is acceptable for your brain to accept in your mind. And for me it was, I sensed that it would be an older person, mm -hmm. maybe in their mid-twenties. I always knew it was going to be somebody's child, but please let it be an older child. Um, so, so when you found out it was a 13-year-old girl. Right. That was not what was in my brain, mm -hmm. what I was planning for in my mind. How did you guys end up connecting? Oh, uh, really through social media and through a friend who started researching and connected us together. And we finally had texts and phone calls and planned to meet. And Patricia's a nurse. And, you know, when we met, she had her stethoscope there. And it was um, just beautiful. Is that the photo we saw mm -hmm. where you were? So this is you listening to Taylor's heart beating bed. inside Patricia's body. Yes. No. <laughs> so, Tara, what is that like? God, that's so hard to put in words. You know, it was such a bittersweet moment. I mean, I was looking at Patricia thinking her life is so improved and she's living at the expense of our loss. Mm -hmm. So it's this whole mix of emotions and you know people have asked us all the time you know meeting her does it give us peace or comfort or mm. you know closure it's like it will never have peace with losing Taylor but when I looked at Patricia it gave us so much strength we knew the decision we had made was the right one for our family and there she was living proof of that decision do you feel a, 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 a burden is the wrong word a, an opportunity to live your life absolutely as good as well as you can because of your situation yeah because I'm a parent because I came close to um, not being a parent and being there for my kids and because of the gift that yeah, I was given I mean gift, it's a yeah. gift truly we, a gift of we life. have a little video I think this really puts it in perspective it's a piece of tape it's a message from Patricia's kids talking to Patricia about how, how happy they are to have their mom back and as you watch this, imagine being Tara and Todd. So let's play this tape. Hi, Mom, this is Jack. I'm happy that you can ride bikes with us and do homework with us and do other kinds of stuff. And I love you very much. And I'm happy that you could um, still run around with us and chase us and all, and ride bikes and swim and all that stuff. So what I'm, I'm so moved by is the honesty, Todd, that you guys have, which is it's beautiful to see her kids oh, saying awesome. that. And it's because of our daughter. Yeah, it's, right. it's and, beautiful. And simultaneously, I can't get that daughter, I can't get that video from my daughter. I got to tell you, it's, uh, it is so beautiful. I mean, in such tragic times that there can be good that can come out of it. And to just see Patricia, to know her family. I mean, I remember... Patricia telling us that the only thing that she wished for every day was to be able to have enough energy to get out of bed to see those two kids before they went to school. I mean, that was her wish. And look and, at her now. I mean, look at her now. It's yeah. awesome. Awesome. Yeah. All right. Coming up, for the first time, the man who received one of Taylor's kidneys will meet the woman, Patricia, who received her heart. Another reunion, another life saved. Be right back. So if most people involved don't want to know, what is the difference with you guys? Why do you need to know? So Todd and Tara lost their 13-year-old daughter, if you're just joining us. It was a skiing accident. It's tragic. They knew just knew their daughter would want to do donate her organs, and so they did. We've already met Patricia, who has Taylor's heart beating inside her right now. And after 12 years of battling a rare disease involving his kidneys, Jonathan was also in dire straits when he received one of Taylor's kidneys. 
He has not met Patricia. So this is the first time that two of the recipients from the Beauty of Taylor are going to meet. Come on out, Jonathan. a hug. Have a seat anywhere you want. Yeah, slide on down here. We'll let mom and dad slide down. So, all right, it's sort of the same kind of questions, but it's a different story. You're in, you're in dire straits. Mm -hmm. You need a kidney. I'm trying, I think one of the important things, the reason Todd and Tara are doing all this work is to make people understand that you can, that organ donation is really magnificent. So what is it like to find out? You get a phone call. The, so the day that I get the call that the kidney's coming, it's, uh, well, I slept through the first call. They usually happen in the middle of the night. And uh, Why I, is, that? is I, that? just You know, I think usually, uh, I think they have time to sort of schedule things and these procurement teams are sort of getting everything ready and getting all the strings tied. And so I think there's actually a time period when they go make these phone calls. Okay. So I slept through it apparently, but Luckily, I heard the one at 6 a.m. And, and got the call, and I knew immediately what it was when I, when I saw the number Boy, so on the call Patricia. right. so Patricia, yeah. Mm -hmm. I recognized the number. I knew it was from University Hospital, and I thought, they're not calling me because I, because I forgot to do blood work or something, not at 6 a.m., so. And what is that like for you? You wake up. Do you know you're better? Um, you do. You do. You, I, I was on dialysis for eight years, and so... In that time, I got used to feeling really poorly. Um, and that's just how you feel all the time. I'm sure it mm -hmm. was so similar for you that just day after day, you just readjust to normal. To the point that you're at 10% of your capacity as a human and you're totally content with it. That's what's normal. How did you find Todd and Tara? How do you figure out who it is that made this beautiful gesture? It, it was a pretty amazing experience. You, you go to these hospital visits constantly right after transplant to make sure everything's okay and, and at one of those it was probably two months after uh, after the surgery a social worker came in and she had a an envelope and she said this is contact from from your donor family and th that that was you guys mm -hmm. you wrote so you did you know Jonathan's story no. no you just wrote to whoever we wrote there's kind of a middle person um, that we the rules are is that as a donor family recipient family we can write a letter they will read it to make sure there's not too much private information on and send it on. So they're kind of the middleman okay. between us until there's, we're all okay with meeting. Well, how do you write a letter about your child that you want them to be able to connect with you, you know, without making them feel guilty about what has happened, that you just want to have them in your life? And so you pour your heart out talking about your child and begging in a way for them to reach back out. Uh -huh. Because you need that contact. Uh, pers yes, yeah. we needed that. And, and so some families can't. I mean, right. some fa families can't, and that's okay, too. I mean, this, because it's This is really sides. rare. Right. Yeah. Really? Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we probably know, between the two of us, several hundred transplant recipients around the country, and a handful I know yeah, of who have met so, people, and of those, so nobody who has say? this sort of relationship. What does that say about Todd and Tara? Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I think it's obvious what it says. I don't think I can say it in words any better than than just knowing it. They're, they're obviously amazing people. So, but I, I mean, no, I wasn't, I wasn't, it wasn't a leading question. So if most people involved, whether it's parents or siblings or just family members, don't want to know, what is the difference with you guys? Why do you need to know? It's, there's no really words for that. It was just a longing. And there are donor families out there all the time who need to know and never get that response back. Mm. It's just as frequently the recipients that don't want to know. I see. Yeah. I mm -hmm. see. And so... I, I could have just left that envelope on the... It was, in fact, made explicitly clear to me. I'm setting this here. I'm letting go of it. No pressure. If you want to take it, take it. If you don't, don't. So when you see Todd and Tara and you know your life has changed, quite possibly saved mm -hmm. because of them, is there... Is it... What, what level of compassion or connection is there? Can you explain it? Yeah, I think pretty instantly we became family. Um, in a way, we became blood relatives. Right. I mean, in, in a literal way. Um, well, and I love that you immediately, not maybe immediately, but you went out and said, I'm going to put this to use, and you went out on a, on a charity bike ride. It was a bit of a ride, yeah. Yeah. How many miles? 500. Wow. 500 miles. <laughs> Not all at once. 
And then the recipient of the charity is? It was Taylor's gift. Taylor's Gifts, okay, yep. and we're gonna talk about that. It's, it, it, this all thing comes to a beautiful uh, crescendo as Taylor comes back into the picture in a big, bright way again. Take a break, be right back. This has got to be top 10 shows we've done just in terms of everything. So in our remaining moments, talking about Taylor, you have a name that you've sort of coined for the people who are keeping her alive, who have parts of her inside them. Mm -hmm. yeah, we call them uh, Taylor's Keepers. And it's just, it's just our special way of connecting and talking about these they're, wonderful they're people. They're keeping her for us. Yeah. Yeah. How many are there, do you know? There are five recipients. We have connected with four out of five which is very rare, That's and very rare. we know it's a blessing and such a privilege. And you guys also started Taylor's Gifts. Taylor's Gift Foundation, yes. Taylor's Gift Foundation. Yeah, Taylor's Gift Foundation, we knew very, very soon. I mean, organ donation really became this thread of hope for us. It became a thing we could hang on to in just a tragic, horrible, horrible time. And uh, we started a foundation. We knew that we wanted to somehow give back. And, um, and I did some research and realized in April of 2010, that really two out of 100 people in Texas were registered where we're from, but only 37 out of 100 people in the United States. And it's like, we can help with this. We know what it's given us as hope, and we can put our efforts and to so this. And so you have to be registered. It can't just be in your health care proxy or somewhere in a safe. You need to be on record. Is, there, is that the... So, Jeff, here's how easy it is. In the next commercial break, the audience on their mobile phones or anybody watching taylorsgift.org, click on register, choose your state, and by the time you come back live, they can seriously be registered to be an organ donor. It's that easy. Will you walk me through that after yeah. the show? Yeah. All right. Absolutely. And then I love, I am wearing this. Get a shot of this. Let me put it over here. <laughs> OPI has created a, a nail polish called, Taylor, what's Taylor it called? Bl Taylor Blue. Taylor Blue. Blue. Oh. Yeah. I'm wearing Taylor Blue. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. That's beautiful, my God. And look at this, this is the book. And, and comment on this because I know we have it in a graphic. Come up here on this one though. Come back to me. Look at that face. That right there, it's amazing. You have a, this beautiful daughter that's living on in so many ways. Uh, beautiful book. Taylorsgift.org seems to be the place to go because you can register, you can find out if you want to celebrate life, whether it's Taylor or your own or somebody else's. You can wear a little Taylor blue. You want to get the book, you can do that. If you're in the audience, you don't need to because they've generously decided to give everybody here a book. And everybody is going home with the nail polish as well so we can all celebrate Taylor. That's our show. Thank you so much for sharing your story. It's you, fantastic. Sam. Well, I'm we just need to let people know that this is a beautiful way they can outlive themselves. It is. It really is. It's a true well gift said. Within. True In gift honor within. of Taylor. Right. That is our show. Thanks for hanging.